I hope some of you are taking a seat actually online as well too. Let's be honest, it is so easy sometimes to worship from home, just sitting on the couch. Come on, man, when you are at home and you're worshiping, man, make your living room into the throne room of the Most High God, amen? Just get into it. I know it's on TV, but it's so easy to be a spectator sometimes, right? And we don't want to have that heart or that attitude. You know, I want to ask you a question to open up our message today, and it's simply, are you devoted or are you distracted? Are you devoted or are you distracted? I hope that question just kind of resonates in your heart throughout this week. It's one of those questions that can't, can't seem to get out of your mind. Are you devoted or are you distracted? I was outside and uh, was talking to God. I love to have my time with Jesus on a daily basis and I like to do it out in nature. Uh, I feel closest to God outside. How many of you know what I'm talking about right now? And the weather outside, come on somebody. Right now it's humid right now, but yesterday was perfect. It was beautiful. And so, uh, man, I was outside and I was spending some time with Jesus. And, and as I did so, I found myself just kind of crying literally out loud. I said out loud, oh God, oh God, I, I don't want my life one day to be surprised by being devoted to something that you really don't care that much about. And then on the flip side, God, finding out one day that what you really cared about I, wasn't really mattered to me. I, I was distracted by it. I was, I was devoted to what wasn't a big flip to you, and then I was distracted by what really mattered to you. And I, I found myself crying that out in prayer and just saying, God, I don't want to be surprised. I don't want to be surprised one day when I stand before you that somehow I got my priorities flipped up. I got so lost in, in all the good spiritual things that I missed the righteous things. I missed the right things from you. Maybe you're like me. You don't want to be surprised one day. Why do we get distracted? It's, it's easy. It's because there's so many new things. And, and out of a, maybe a sincere heart to do the right things, it's like, all right, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. And after a while, we're just like, ah, there is so much that we are supposed to be devoted to. And that devotion ends up becoming a distraction because there's so much around that it gets exhausting. Can I get an amen to that? Right? I mean, we know the feeling. And, and I think there's just something in my heart that believes that Christianity is very simple. I think it's probably in your heart as well, too, that there's something inside of you that knows that Christianity is very, very simple. I, I didn't say it's easy. It is very challenging at times, but, but we make it way too complicated. And I found that sometimes I like the idea of what's new and I want more new to just give me new excitement in my life. But I worry that in my search for new, I've missed going back to what has meaning. I, I've missed what is the original thing that God wants to pull me back to. I've gotten distracted. And, and I think what God really wants us to pull back to, this idea of devotion, what is that simple thing? What is that simple faith? I think it's just having a daily revelation and relationship with Jesus Christ. I think it's this idea, yeah, you can clap to that. That's good. That's fine. That's great. It's having this daily devotion, this daily simple revelation of Jesus. I, I don't need my mom's revelation. Sorry, mom. I don't need my friend's revelation. I don't need my brother or my sister or even the pastor's revelation. I need a revelation of Jesus Christ that's personal and daily and intimate, and it's just between him and I. And I think you know that you need that too. But we make it so complicated, right? And we get so distracted. And we our hearts for devotion, but we get distracted by everything else. And I think God is just calling us back. And he's saying, come back to me. That heart cry makes me want to repent. And I think there is this, this groaning in the church world, even right now because of COVID. COVID's like a sifting. It's like a cleaning. It's like a purifying. And, and I think the church is getting back and we're crying out saying, God, I'm sorry. 
God, I'm sorry that I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry that I've been distracted by so many other things. God, I just want to be devoted to you. I want to come back to that simple revelation that nothing else matters. Does your heart cry like mine does? Does your heart just simply say, nothing else will do? I just want you. Just say another song will take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. Oh, I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm
Devoted, not distracted. Nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. When I think of this idea of devoted and not distracted, it brings me back to a word that I find in Scripture. It's found in Acts 2, verses 42. 47, and it's the beginning of the New Testament church. It's where this got started. And it says this, that the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled at awe at the many wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to everyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. When I think about the New Testament church that was birthed in these verses and the work of the Holy Spirit and what he accomplished and what he was doing, I think it's very simple. In a world where it's easy to be distract, distracted by all the things we're supposed to be devoted to, I think the faith and the relationship, the revelation of Jesus that each and every one of us can have becomes very clear. And today, as your pastor, I would like to just bring us back to that focus. Whether we're online or we're on site, I think we have a chance. I think we have an opportunity to come back to a very simple faith, to a very pure faith, to a very clean faith, and become even more devoted and not distracted God was doing something supernatural in the early church, and I believe he wants to do it again. I believe that we are in a time of history where God wants to truly show up and show off in his church today. If we would just say, nothing else, Jesus, but you matters. We just want to come back to that simple faith in a world that's so distracting at times. And so as I look at this passage and this idea of what were they devoted to, because it's so easy for my heart to be devoted in so many different ways, because I like new, right? New's exciting, new's fun, but if I would just get off the new and get back to the original idea, what do I need to go back to? And I see this idea of devotion. I see four things. They stand out like a sore thumb in this passage. But let's look at them. First of all, it says they devoted themselves. Even before I get into this passage, the original Greek says they continually devoted themselves. It's this idea that there was a continual daily devotion that was required for the church to be the church, for the believers to be the believers. And if you want to know how to live out this, this simple faith, challenging at times, but simple, yes, this simple faith, we have to be continually devoted. We have to re-enlist and re-sign our heart up every single day to say, God, by your grace, I'm going to be devoted to what you're devoted to. I'm not going to live a life that's distracted. Are you with me? Say yes. I want to live that life. I want to live that life. They were continually devoted. They continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What is the apostles' teaching? It's simply the scripture. It's simply the word of God. The early church, the apostles were teaching. What were they teaching? They were teaching the epistles and the gospels, the things that the Holy Spirit was inspiring them to write, and they were communicating that to each other. And as the early church was devoted to the word of God, something changed in their life. God continued to add to their numbers. The church moved. God's presence was shown up and shown off, but they had to be devoted to that first simple thing. 
Here's what I found. I think a lot of people in this world, it is easy for us to become a Bible-believing church, but not a Bible-living church. And there's a massive difference between a Bible-believing Christian and a Bible-living Christian. I want to be the latter. I want to be a Bible-living Christian. I want to live in the book of Acts. I want this thing to come alive in my heart. And I want to see God do what he said he would do now. Not just 2,000 years ago, but now. For God is not finished yet. Matter of fact, as the prophet Joel said, he's just getting started. He's warming up and, and this whole beautiful thing that we're living in, though it might be challenging at times, I believe it's the earth pangs and it's the groanings and it's the yearnings of Jesus coming back to save his bride. But we must be ready and the only way to know how to do that is to be devoted to the word of God, to be ones that don't just believe it but actually live it. Are you hungry for the scripture? Are you hungry to hear God's voice speak to you in the margins of our life? That's this series title, In the Margins. And what I mean by that is as we get into God's word on a daily basis, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and gives you revelation as you read scripture. And I write in the margins and God is able to communicate to me in a way that maybe I've lost touch with. <laughs> I'd like to ask you to do something a little bit unique, a little bit weird. Next time you're alone, and I highly suggest you do this when you're alone. People might think you're a little bit creepy. <laughs> but next time you're alone with the scriptures, next time you're alone with God's word, I ask that you maybe pull it close to your face. Pull it intimately close to your face. And then I ask you, do you feel it? Do you feel the warmth of his breath? Do you feel the closeness? of his heart. And even though that idea and even this concept may seem a little bit kooky and strange, and it probably is, but when you think about it, this idea comes from 2 Timothy 3, 16, that simply says this. It says, all scripture is breathed by God. This is the breath of God. All scripture is breathed by God. And then it goes on to say, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in all righteousness. Would you just pull the scripture close and allow the word, allow the logos, allow the rhema, the spirit of God, the pneuma of God to just wash over your life? Because here's what I know. In 2020, it is so easy to feel disconnected from God. It's just the season of social isolation. And if you ever feel disconnected from God, if you feel like God is not knowable, if you feel like, man, I'm just not connecting with God in a way that I should, may I encourage you to get back into the word of God. God is not hard to find and devotion to him is not hard to accomplish when we simply pull ourselves close to the scripture. For it's in the scripture that he speaks. It's in the scripture that his spirit moves in our hearts and in our lives. He shapes us. He remakes us. He loves us. Pull yourself close to what he has to say. Being devoted to scripture, the apostles' teaching was the first thing that the church did. The second simple thing, pragmatic, that they did was, and then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and then to fellowship. Fellowship in 2020. I don't think there has ever been a year in my life, in the last 40 years of my life, where fellowship has been more needed than ever before. The early church understood this idea of fellowship. And what is fellowship? Fellowship in the Greek, it's, it's simply the word koinia. And, and, and in that word, what the word means in the Greek is commonness. And it's in the context of contribution, sacrifice, and a gift. Koinia. It's a contribution in the commonness and the community of the church. What's interesting is this is the very first time that this word is used in the scripture. There's a lot of pages before I got to this part. And this is the very first time that it's ever mentioned. And I believe that this is a gift of the Holy Spirit for the church today. See, I think a lot of us are confusing friendship with fellowship in the church. We're confusing friendship and fellowship. And, and fellowship, or excuse me, friendship is great. It's wonderful. We all need friends. But God wants to move beyond friendship for you to have a deeper fellowship with him and with each other. 
And it's a gift. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. But we have to understand what fellowship is. It's this commonness. It's this contribution in the environment of gifting and sacrifice. When you look at this passage and you look at it in the context of Scripture, that's what's very clear. It's this sacrificial gift. You see, the New Testament church understood that fellowship was a sacrifice. What do you mean, Josh? They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You see, we're kicking off our life group season this week. And we're saying, hey, join a life group. Find not only community, but find fellowship. Let's be the church. Let's actually meet where? In homes. In the message version, it says Barnes and Noble. It says they met in homes. They got together. That's a part of this whole thing. It's, it's not something that we forsake. It's not something that we pull away. But they understood that fellowship was costly because it cost them their time. It cost them their convenience. It cost them their schedule. In 2020, it is so easy to hide behind the excuse of, well, it's COVID. I just want to be safe. That is great for you to be safe, but do not be selfish. I am all about being safe and healthy. But church, whether you're online or off-site, let's not be selfish because the only way that you will find the koinonia, the fellowship of the church that God has called this culture to become is when you are together sacrificing of yourself for the betterment of the church. It's the only way you'll ever find it. And so they made sacrifices. And, and so I want to encourage you as we, we're kicking off life groups this week. If you haven't signed up online yet, go to crossatlanta.com slash life groups. Sign up, whether it's a virtual life group or it's, it's an in-person life group. Let's do fellowship together. What I, I've seen is so often times, and I think we're all guilty of this, right? We're all guilty of being consumers more than contributors. And so often we're, all, we're, we're guilty of going into a church or going into a life group and saying, well, you know what, they're just, I'm really not getting anything from it. No one really cares about me. No one's really, I, I'm not feeling the joy of fellowship in this group. I don't really feel like I belong. So I'm going to bounce out. Maybe you felt that in this church. Maybe you felt that in another church or <laughs> maybe you felt that in a life group. It's funny, we don't really feel that way when it comes to just normal friends, because we understand that it takes time for actual relationship to be developed there. We give them the benefit of the doubt, but we don't want to give anybody in the church the benefit of the doubt, because I would rather have the excuse that no one cares for me than deal with the cost of fellowship. Am I preaching yet? And so here's what I know is as we give in that cost of fellowship, it takes a little bit of time. But as you put yourself out there, things actually change. And so we start to say, well, I, I've just never felt that joy of fellowship that you're talking about, Josh. Don't you understand that the only way you feel the joy of fellowship is when you contribute and it costs you something with the sacrifice of your life. It is not a worldly thing. That is friendship. When everything just works out for you because we have things in common and therefore I'm friends with you because you like me. Me, I like you, but there is something spiritually significant about the joy of fellowship because it costs you something that maybe you don't want to pay, but you'll never receive the joy of it until you contribute to it. You just won't. And so if you're looking to feel the graciousness and the love of God and feel like this church is my church, can I tell you what? We are an okay church, but we are a great life group church. The preaching is all right. But I'll tell you what, where it really happens. If you had to choose between a life group or hearing me speak, you know what I would choose? I'd choose you being in a life group. I am probably one of the only pastors in America that says that. Why? Because I understand that discipleship is messy. And the moment that you get into real relationships and deal with real friction and deal with the cost of your contribution, lives are changed. Not only yours, but the person who came and was changed because of yours. Man, I'm preaching really good today. I mean, I'm enjoying the message. I don't know if you are, but I am. I'm just... And trust me, I don't have much of an ego. I get humbled after service every week. It's all cool. But it's this idea of fellowship, right? See, but he, like, all right, I believe. I agree with you, pastor. All right, good. That's good. Preach it, pastor. All right, cool. Are you signing up for life group? See, because the difference is there's a difference between a Bible-believing person and a Bible-living person. 
Come back to that and leave that right there. Like Kermit the Frog meme. I'm not just leave that there. Just set that up. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Let me keep on going. Fellowship, teaching, to the breaking of bread. To breaking of bread. When we read this in scripture, it's this reference to communion. It's this idea of the Lord's Supper, of breaking bread and doing life together. See, when you're in fellowship, then another thing can happen. You can break bread together and you can remember the Lord's death. And underneath your seats are some communion elements. I'd love for you to take that right now. And if you're watching online, I want to encourage you to join us in communion in a moment. And go to your pantry, go to your kitchen, grab some bread, grab some juice, grab whatever you got. You know, it's not important what you have or what you don't have. If you've got to grab a Mountain Dew and some saltines, that's all good. Because here's the thing, it's this act of remembrance, it's this idea of breaking bread. And what I found about breaking bread, listen to me, is bread is never broken alone. I thought about bringing a loaf from home today. I couldn't find any, I went through the kitchen. I would have needed to do the saltines if we're having communion at home. And I was looking for bread to use as an illustration, it's this idea of if I'm eating bread, I don't break it, I just eat it. It's my bread. But broken bread is made to be shared. The only reason you break the bread is because you're in communion with others. The only reason Christ's body was broken was because he was broken to be shared with you. And the only reason that we break our body, our our body is broken is so that healing can be found through the death and the resurrection of Christ through, through communion. A lot of us have broken worlds and broken needs and broken things. Can I tell you there's healing in the broken body of Jesus Christ? But the only way that you will ever find it is if you deal with the cost of fellowship, you deal with the cost of koinia, you put yourself back, and you break bread with somebody else besides yourself. Here's what I've learned. I can never be enemies with someone that I've had communion with. I've never been able to do it. Because it forces me to deal with the unreconcilable differences I have in my heart. And that's what the early church was doing. Actually, when they broke bread, what they were saying was, my body is becoming a part of your body. Your body was becoming a part of mine. Believe it or not, the New Testament church, a symbol of the New Testament church, was even before the the dove or the fish or something like that. If you go to the upper room, which I've been to in Jerusalem, there is a picture, there is an engraving of a pelican there, or excuse me, um, a flamingo. Flamingo. If I've got my history correct, if I don't, forgive me. If I've got the bird wrong, forgive me, but you'll get the point. And the point with this bird is it actually eats of its own flesh. It takes of its flesh to feed its young, to feed those around it. And the New Testament church was trying to say through communion, I take of myself so that you might be fed. Jesus inside of me to you. Jesus inside of you to me. And that is how the church is built. And it's this idea of communion that we find healing. And folks, can I say in 2020, the year that the world is looking for reconciliation, the only place they will find it is in the broken body of Jesus Christ. It's found in this church. His brokenness, our brokenness as we reconcile with each other is how we find hope again. And so right now, I want you to simply take out that bread. And the word of God says the same night that Jesus was betrayed. And that's a whole nother message. Can can you understand that even in the moments where you feel are in your darkest seasons, the moments that you feel most betrayed, that is when God's bread is supposed to be broken in your life so that you might commune with him and commune with those who've hurt you. And in the same night that Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body that has been broken for you. So Father, right now, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you for the healing that you provide the restitution and the reconciliation that you provide through your brokenness. For Father, as I understand that I am broken before you and you provide my healing, it forces me to reconcile and provide healing to those around me. I'm not able to keep others at arm's distance. I'm, I, I'm called to bring them in because you brought me close. And as you have forgiven me, God, I choose to forgive those who've sinned against me. So, Father, we thank you for your broken body. May you provide healing, 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 healing in our lives, in our relationships, in our bodies, in the name of Jesus. Whether you're on site or online, why don't you go ahead and take that bread right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 
In the same way Jesus goes on to say this, this juice, it represents this cup, it represents the new covenant. It represents my blood that will be shed for you. The disciples, the early disciples didn't get the analogy and it's a pretty wild analogy when you think about it. Eating God's body drinking God's blood. We actually talked about it last week. It's a wild analogy that Jesus is giving us, but we understand that through it, through Christ's redemption and through his sacrifice, his blood that was shed on the cross, that is how we are atoned for our sins. His blood covers our past, our present, and our future, and he's able to redeem us from all of our unrighteousness. And Jesus said, take this cup as a reminder of my sacrifice, that my blood in this new covenant, I want to pull you into a new arrangement with me. I want to, I want to pull you into a new relationship with me because I love you. I'm madly crazy in love with you, and I will give absolutely everything, including my life, so that I might be close to you. And so, Father, right now, we just remember your blood, your sacrifice for us, Scripture says for us to inspect our hearts, and that's what we do right now. God, forgive us of our sin. Make us pure. Make us righteous. Make us holy. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of who you are. Forgive us, Lord. Purify us. Make us right with you. As we take this juice, we thank you and we celebrate your sacrifice that makes us whole. Go ahead and take the cup. Thank you, Jesus. As we go into life groups this next week, I'm inviting all of our life group leaders, whether they're virtual or online, or excuse me, on site, uh, to make their way to the welcome counter on the way out today. We've got communion elements for your life groups. And so this first week going into life group season, again, sign up. You can do that today. Almost everyone waits till the last minute. Congratulations, you're at the last minute. This, this is the week. You don't wait any longer. This is the week. Sign up. They are filling up very quickly, though. I would say most of them are really filled. But we love to have all of our life groups share in communion this week. And so life group leaders, on your way out, we, we have communion elements for you to take. And if you're in a virtual group, you do what we just did right here. If you're in a virtual life group, you just... Everybody grabs something from their pantry and you create that moment right there and read the scripture and you have that moment together. Or if you want, you can come by church this week. Our doors will be open and we'll have communion elements for you to pick up. We'll be here Monday through Thursday. Because we want to be a church that finds healing in the brokenness of our Savior and the brokenness of each other. We find healing and redemption for each other. Let's be devoted to those kind of things. Let's not be distracted by everything else. The breaking of bread. And then lastly, the early church was devoted to prayer. They're devoted to prayer. I, I'm reminded of a, of a father and a son. True story. That went out, did some errands. And, and after the errands were done, they said, hey, the dad said to his son, let's, let's go and let's get some sandwiches. And so they went to a diner, right, a greasy spoon. And the son was really excited because he saw the stools and the big table, right, that bar counter in the diner. And, and so dad and son sat there and dad lifted up his child, put him on the seats, I'm guessing, and really excited to spend some time with dad. And they order their food, they get the sandwich, everything, and dad looks at the sun and says, son, why don't we just have a moment of silent prayer? So the two bow their heads. And Dad says his prayer. And he gets done first and he looks up and he notices that his son still has his hands bowed, his head's down, still in a posture of prayer. And so he waits on him. And then he waits some more. <laughs> and then he waits some more. And then he waits some more. And then finally the kid looks up at his dad. And dad's like, son, what were you praying about? Like, that was a long prayer. What were you talking to God about? And the, son, the young boy innocently looked at his father and said, dad, how am I supposed to know? That was a silent prayer. Here's what I worry about today. That many of us have intentions to connect with the living God, but all we ever offer up are silent prayers. 
We have an intention of connecting with him. We have a heart, we have a desire. But like a young child, we never really make the attempt to turn our silent prayers into vocal cries. It's time to cry out to a father. It's time to cry out to your God. See, I, I just have this belief that Jesus misses you. Isn't that simple? Jesus misses you. Online campus, Jesus misses you. That has nothing about you being in a building. That has everything to do with you spending time daily devoting yourself to prayer with him. Jesus misses you. You know, or this last season, we've had a beautiful time. I, I, I think you felt it. I should have felt it. We've had 20 days of prayer and fasting. And man, hasn't God been good? It's been so good. It's been so good. <laughs> Some of you, I love you all. Like, Josh, the last three weeks, you've been really good. Good job on speaking. You know, I don't think I'm that great. Can I tell you what makes a difference? Prayer, fasting, expectation, faith. When there is a culture and there is an attitude of hunger and thirst after righteousness sake, for whatever reason, the preaching gets better because the soil is ready to hear. The hearts are ready to receive. See, prayer sets the stage for God to speak. That's what happens. And so many of you know, most of you have been a part of it. Every single Wednesday, 7 o'clock at night, we've been having these prayer and worship nights. And boy, it's been a joy. It's been a lot of fun, really calling and crying out to God. And, and so we made the decision as a staff, and I felt like, you know, this was something that our church wanted to do during this season. We're going to just continue that. And so um, every Wednesday, 7 o'clock, online, it's our online platform. We wanted to do something that we could be united together as a church on all at the same place. And that's why we're not doing it in the building. That's not why we're doing it at some outside location. We're doing it all on our online campus because we want all of our prayers to be united in one place. Because in a time of division, I'll tell you what, prayer brings us back to the heart of God. Amen? Amen. And so I'd like for you to join us every, every Wednesday, 7 o'clock, crosstheland.com slash live. And let's cry out to Jesus. Amen? Let's cry out to Jesus. I'm reminded of one other story of <laughs> one of my favorites, actually. History records that there was a, an African tribe that got radically saved by God. God moved, and one thing that they got, they got the whole devotion part. One thing that they really understood was being devoted to prayer, to daily prayer. They were continually devoted to prayer. And so as history records, they would, all these different tribesmen would go into the thicket or they would go into the bush and daily have their time with the Lord in prayer. And what was wild about the whole thing is after time, they would start to create a path where they prayed. You see every tribesman, tribeswoman, they would, they would pray in the same place, pacing back and forth, back and forth. They would connect with God in a personal and beautiful way. And after they prayed in that place for a season, it would really beat down the grass on their path. And each tribesman over time started to recognize which person prayed where, which spot was marked by which person. And that was their private sanctuary with the Lord. They understood who prayed where. And what happened in this tribes, tribe was a beautiful thing that occasionally they would notice that one of the believers in the community, they started to notice that grass started to grow on their path, which just simply told them that they had not been making the habit to daily seek the Lord through prayer. And it was at this point that that tribesman would reach out to that other tribesman and, and simply and very kindly, not legalistically, but with hope and with joy and with a lot of grace, simply say, my friend, the grass it grows on your path. The grass, it, it grows on your path. It was their simple way of saying, it looks like you haven't spent some time with Jesus. And he misses you. He misses you. 
See, there's a difference between Bible believing and Bible living. I want to be a person of the book, but I also want to be a person who lives out this book by the grace and the power of the Spirit inside of me. I want to be devoted to these four things. You know what's interesting? I said that oftentimes it's the new things that gets us distracted instead of being devoted. We want new, 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 new. That oftentimes distracts us from the original thing that God wants to bring us back to. But what's beautiful is, can I just tell you something? That when we go back to the original things that God has, what he's outlined for us in the word, what's, what's kind of wild is he actually produces new. I wrote down in my Bible, as they were devoted to teaching, they received new revelation. As they were devoted to the fellowship, they received deeper relationships. As they were devoted to breaking of the bread, they received healing and a new covenant. And as they were devoted to prayer, they received new power. They received new power. And God multiplied what was happening in the church. Why? Because they went back to the main thing. They went back to being devoted and not distracted. And in some scriptures, it says that 3,000 were added even in a day. When God grabs a hold of our church and we learn how to be devoted to the key things and not be distracted by every other thing, I believe he will not only change this church, but he will change us. One more story. I'm in a story mood today, I King George V, he was about to deliver a speech, a very important speech. It was actually being communicated in America. I feel like the year was, uh, I don't want to quote the year, I don't know. But it was during nuclear disarmament. And King George V was about to do a speech. It was in the dawn of radio. This isn't the King's speech that many of you are familiar with. It was a different one. That was King George VI. But as he was delivering his speech right before he was going on, it was being routed through a radio station in New York. And right before the speech was to occur, the cable that allowed communication to millions potentially of people to hear the King's speech broke in that New York radio station. It just snapped in two. There was a young engineer. He didn't know what to do to fix the problem. It, he, there wasn't enough time to fix the problem adequately. And so he did what he only thought he could do. The young engineer grabbed one end of the cable and another end of the cable. And with 250 volts going through his body for 15 to 20 minutes, he held the connection becoming the living conduit so that the people of the U.S. could hear the king's speech. Listen to me, friends. When we are devoted to what God has called us to be devoted to, though it might be challenging at times, we become the conduit so the world can hear the King's speech. You and I are called to be devoted. Bow your heads, close your eyes. On site and online, let's make this a sacred moment in our living rooms and in our auditorium.